Welcome back, everyone. We just did trust, and now we're going to do the family law lecture. And before I hand it over to Will, I just want to explain why my name is Ill-Gotten Gains and my uh, album title is Restitution, because we as a class are coming up with names, singer, rapper names, and album mixtape covers that will make us remember these uh, topics. For instance, in the room, we have ECE, which is risk of loss, which is going to be equitable conversion. And I think it's a play on easy -E, I like that. We have the straw man, which is abolished in Florida. And the name is straw man. It's like one of the hardest names in rap history. We have attractive nuisance by a lovely uh, diva who is an attractive nuisance. And um, <laughs> sure, her CD is broken trampoline, which is excellent because we know what that means. Broken trampoline could be an attractive nuisance. Um, Double TIP, um, it's because TTIP, Time, Title, Interest, and Possession, and her album Joint Tenancy. I think that's a, a homage to a TIP, um, Trouble Man. And then Fact Finder, Excited Utterance, DJ Fact Finder, um, Excited Utterance, because it's up to the finder of fact to determine, I guess, that that's an excited utterance, and excited utterance is uh, admissible hearsay. And then Sus Class, Sus Class, um, sounds like, like a punk rock band, and their debut album, Strictly Scrutinized, which is something in con law. Um, we had Professor Will uh, here today. I wanted him to be Will of Attainder, but he thought that was too basic, so he ended up going with uh, XXX. Post XX post facto. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty good. To the late XXX Tentacion, if I'm saying that right. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's cool. We, we have some fun in this class, but uh, one area of law that, oh, before I, I pass it over to Will, I did want to show next week, everyone's going to come to class with their um, mixtape covers, but I'm one step ahead of you all. My name is Ill Gotten Gains, and this is my album Restitution, and you can buy my album in stores somewhere in the metaverse. Um, but now, Will, I'll have you teach family law, so I'm going to turn over the... Uh, uh, host to you and let's learn about family law about divorce alimony child support and I'll tell everyone family law is my least favorite subject because I don't like divorce I like true love and happiness forever but I do know that the one best thing is if you find yourself in a hole in a trap in family law you can dig yourself out by thinking about the best interests of the children that's my biggest take other than that yeah it's up to you Will Okay, yeah, so um, I think I agree with Andrew. When I first took the bar, I got, when I first took the bar the very first time, I got a 13 out of 100 on- and, Well, just to remind you, you have to unshare and then- right, Yeah, we can do it again. Yeah, so when I first took the bar, I got a 13 out of 100 on a family law essay. Um, it was my worst subject, I hated it. Um, and then I studied with, um andrew and ibis and now i i teach it and uh, i i i do think family law is one of the more um attainable subjects it can be very memorizable um i will say that for this lecture i'm going to focus almost entirely on separation there is some law that you can get into in terms of actual marriage like whether they recognize common law marriages they do from other states but they don't recognize it in the state of florida um, you know, like what, what, what can be an annulment, what can lead to an annulment of marriage, things like that. Those things generally aren't tested on the bar. Normally what they're testing about is separation. So, um, I'm going to just focus on separation today. There is about, you know, a page or two. If you go into the IBIS outlines, you can see there's a page or actually more like five pages of like stuff about actual marriage, but a majority of it is going to be about separation. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, right. everyone in class this afternoon, before we do the essays, we're gonna do a quick run through of my outlines and notes just to make sure we didn't right. leave any stones unturned. This is just overview. Right. So yeah, so this, the, and again, this is like the, and like we talked about for trust, 99.9% .9 of family law essays, you'll be able to write this exact information out and, and probably get a lot of points for it. Like not even looking at the fact that you just know it's a family law. If you write this essay, you're gonna do good. Um, and so then that comes, then it becomes important to get the, uh, go through the outlines, get that other extra information 
so that when they add those little tidbits of things that they don't normally test on, you can be hitting those tidbits as well. So, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump in um, to family law. So um, this is the acronym for family law, MJV PEACE, and it stands for Modification Jurisdiction Venue. So I like to think of these things as separate from, um, the MJV is separate from the PEACE because this is all um, procedural stuff, right? Like which court is going to get it? Which court is allowed to hear it? Where is it? Where should the courts hear it? Things like that. And then the piece gets into the actual meat and potatoes of, of separation. So parenting, equitable distribution, alimony, child support, everything else, which is actually attorney's fees and dissolution. Everything else has plagued me the entirety of the time that I have made this, um, this kind of cheat sheet and this PowerPoint. Um, if you can think of a better thing for me to turn this into, I'd love to hear it. But the MJV piece works so well. It, it, I think it like really fits into people's heads so well that I don't want to change it too much. No, I like it. It's it. like Michael Jordan piece. Yeah. Um, and return back. And, and that's the best thing about acronyms is you can find your own way to fit it into your head. Um, my head is just really good at memorizing nonsense. So this is what works for me. If you like, and I think um, my one of my students, so I don't, I don't want to call them out on the recording, but she indicated that it makes more sense to her if it's more like um, inflammatory or more, you know, raunchy kind of stuff. So that stuff works for her. She can make it more raunchy, things like that. Whatever works for you, make it work for you. Um, and so for me, MJV piece works well, kind of flows well. So we'll start there. So the first M stands for modification. Um, so. Um, modification. So generally, um, most things are modifiable. Um, you should start from that point. But from the from the, the ground up, you should assume everything is going to be modifiable. Um, but you have to recognize whether the modification is necessary as a result of um, unforeseen change. And so I'm actually going to um, go out of this real quick because. This doesn't include something that I want it to include. Um, I forgot to include a good sentence. Just give me, bear with me for one second. Um, there's, there's a sentence I need to show you guys, but it's very important. And these are my cheat sheets. You guys are more than welcome to these if you need, if you want them. Um, you can yeah. also see the PowerPoint right now. Oh, really? Okay. You have to just move. Yeah, to, yeah. There we go. Um, it's okay. Go into my cheat sheet. There we go. So this sentence right here. Knowing of substantial, material, and unanticipated change of circumstances. Use this anytime someone is talking about modifying anything. This exact sentence is the rule. It is the law a showing of substantial material and unanticipated change of circumstances. So, and like I said, generally things are going to be modifiable. You have to show of substantial material and unanticipated change of circumstances. So now let's go back into um, the PowerPoint. Can someone, one of the people in the room, remind me what you need to show? What was that sentence you just said? What do you need to show modification? A substantial, unanticipated, uh, I guess, material change of circumstances. Perfect. That's perfect. What it's about, being a parent. This is parent time. Yeah. I don't like family. Yeah. Rules. I'm learning the parent rules. A substantial, unanticipated, material change in circumstance. Yeah. Uh, if you use that anytime someone's modifying, use it as many times as you can. Just keep saying that over and over again. And um, just one more time, Will, you have to share and unshare. It's Zoom's fault. It's product liability case that we're making after the numbed, but maybe. But uh, there we go. There we go. All right, let's do it. Awesome. So yeah. So um, and I'll make sure I'll add that to the PowerPoint. Um, but so parenting plans are generally modifiable, like we said. But child growing up and a known drug user continue to use drugs are not unanticipated. Remember, we said unanticipated is one of the things. Obviously, kids are going to grow up. Not obviously, but probably a known drug user is probably going to continue using drugs. Those are not unanticipated things. So just look for those things when you're when you're doing your questions. Um, equitable distribution is the only thing that is not modifiable. So I, we're going to get to equitable di distribution in a little bit. It's the E and MJV piece. But 
you can't modify equitable distribution. If you agreed on equitable distribution before or there was no agreement at all, equitable distribution is going to be the law of the land. Um, alimony and child support are modifiable generally. Um, and these are the things you're going to be looking for, changes in financial ability. So if I and my wife get divorced and we have one kid um, and I'm a lawyer right now and I'm a public defender, so I'm not making that much money. If I go and start my own firm and all of a sudden I'm pulling in, you know, six figures every year, well, then my my change, my change there's a change in my financial ability and I'll be able to pay more in alimony and or child support. And then change in the need of parties and child. So a $50 or 15% difference between the past award and the child support guideline. So that you don't have to know the guidelines. I do not, I do not recommend you looking, even looking at the guidelines. Don't look at them. You don't need to know them. But just say this sentence. If there is a $50 or 15% difference between the, what they were getting and what the guidelines are now, they can make a change. And then again, like if I, I, I currently get medical insurance from my job, if I left and went into the private field and my wife was still getting medical insurance, well, then there might be a change in what she has to pay to me in alimony. Um, and then finally, uh, my mom actually just retired last month. Um, if, if she and my dad got divorced, um, then the, her retirement would affect the alimony. But remember, retirement of a party only affects alimony. It does not affect child support. So there's a lot in there, but it's all very simple. I mean, it's like short, quick things you can really snap through. Um, on an essay, I'm only just mentioning it as, as a flyby. Um, any questions about those things? No? Awesome. Um, so that's modifications. Remember, we're doing MJVP. So M stands for modification. We're going to get into jurisdiction. Um, and there are three ki two kinds of jurisdiction you're talking about. Personal jurisdiction. Is, personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction are the same thing as they are in Civ Pro. Um, but um, personal matters jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, you need to consent, personally served or domiciled in the county where the um, court resides, and there has to be minimal contact with that um, jurisdiction. So that's the that's the standard personal jurisdiction in um, federal law, standard pers personal jurisdiction in um, in this kind of law. Um, subject matter jurisdiction, generally, this family court is going to have jurisdiction very rare you're going to see a subject matter jurisdiction issue but just mention it family court has subject matter jurisdiction over family court issues um however the residency requirement changes um, in florida you have to be resident of that for six months before the dissolution if not you revert back to wherever you were six months uh, a resident for six months so I've lived in Osceola County for six months right now. If my wife and I got divorced, the family court of, of um, Osceola County would have subject matter jurisdiction. However, let's say we didn't live here for six months before the before our dissolution, it would go to wherever we did live six months. So let's say we lived in Miami-Dade for six months before we lived in Osceola for six months, or for five months. Well, then we would revert back to Miami-Dade. And then finally, the UCCJA, you have to memorize this, UCCJA applies to ch uh, children. And it's the exact same rule, has to be a resident of Florida for six months or born there. So if a child wasn't born there, um, resident of Florida for six months, and if not, it reverts back to whatever state they were a resident of for six months. And so for jurisdiction, we have a bit of a, we have a, we have a pop quiz. Um, Ooh, have quiz, my favorite. Um, Amy and Bob get divorced after five after a five year marriage. Amy's in the military, so they have moved all over. From January to February, for about one month, they lived in Georgia. From February to May, five months, they lived in Virginia, and then from May to the day they got divorced, September, months about four months, they lived in Florida. They had a child together in May of 2022 while living in Virginia. Where is their personal jurisdiction? Where is their subject matter jurisdiction? And where does the UCCJA apply for the kid? So let's get um, cold call people. Does anyone want to volunteer to talk about personal jurisdiction? Where do they get married? 
Uh, let's say they got married in um, Georgia. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm just gonna guess here, but is that from May to December they were in Florida, so that's yeah. seven months, right? Yeah. Wouldn't wouldn't it just be Florida for right? So for Florida or and whatever county they lived in during that time. Right. And so we go back. Let's go back and take a look. Ah. Sorry, being oh shoot no stop being very glitchy. It's Zoom, not you or PowerPoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it does this. Um, let's go back and take a look. Can you? I think you can see this. No, just a pop quiz. Um, pop quiz, but with a different different question. There, there we go. So jurisdiction is con um. Consent personally served a Domus file. Can you see that? No, maybe if you unshare and share again. It's a private I don't know why it does this. It's a liability case. It's not your fault. So. There we go. Okay. So if we go back and take a look. Um, put it into the slideshow format because I want to make sure we can look at this. So consent personally served a domicile of minimum contact. So I'll give you much information, as much information about PJ in this. But if they're living in. Florida from May to December and the, the divorce started in May, December, I think we can probably assume they were at least personally served in Florida, right? So you got personal jurisdiction where, wherever they, wherever they were served. Um, and then what about subject matter jurisdiction? So this was an easier one. Does anyone want to give me this one How about attractive nuisance? Are you there? I'm here. <laughs> um, for subject matter jurisdiction, I was going to say Florida as well. What specifically, who, who ha, what court has subject matter jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. We can go back. The, just the general family, the family court of that jurisdiction. If they live in Osceola County, wherever, wherever, the, whatever county they live, that county is going to have the family court of that county is going to have um, subject matter jurisdiction. And then finally, where does the UCCJA apply for the kids? Kids together in May of 2022 while living in Virginia. So would it be Virginia because the child was born there, but since they've been in Florida for now seven months, it would be Florida? Yeah, it could be would either. It can be both. Okay, it can be both right. at the same time, yes. So the, 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 they can sue for child support in either Virginia or Florida because the UCCJ applies, JA applies to both. Um, Got you. Awesome. For, for keep... PJ, for sorry, for PJ and for, no. for subject matter jurisdiction, is it only it can only be one wherever yeah. they're it can only be one, it's just wherever they last. Um and remember you can always consent to PJ. The, right. so generally whatever rules you think of in the civil and the um civ pro field, they all apply to family law, except for the six month requirement for subject matter jurisdiction and for the UCCJ. So if you memorize rules for personal jurisdiction. Just apply them here. They're the exact same rules. So remember, you can always consent to personal jurisdiction in another another jurisdiction. And isn't it true that just one of the spouses had to have been living there? For... Yes. Right. Yes. So it's either, and remember, it's where the controversy exists, so it's where the marriage existed, or it's where the um, controversy exists in that, where the divorce, where they, where the uni union was, you know? So um, there's a lot of different ways to look at it um, from a, from a family law perspective, but generally just apply the personal jurisdiction, the Civ Pro you've already learned for your uh, multiple choice, apply it here in terms of the, the marriage. And personal jurisdiction yeah. is where they consent, personally served or domiciled, or the minimum of contacts. Subject matter jurisdiction is generally the family court and the residency requirements 
are, um, you know, where they've been living for at least six months before the dissolution. And you were saying the UCCJ applies to the child. They must have been resident for for six months or born there, and they haven't been in the state for six months. It reverts back to the last state where they where they were. Cool. Yes, exactly. All right, exactly. Let's, let's keep it moving. Awesome. So yeah, MCJ V uh, MJV piece. The next one is venue. Um, so venue is really easy. Venue is proper where the breach occurred. I'm going back to the slide show mode. Um, you have to go in and out again. Last time. There we go. Yeah, I won't, I won't leave it again. Um, so proper where the breach occurred, the marriage last existed, or one spouse lived. So when it says breach occurred, that means the breach to the, the marriage contract. So if one person cheated, um, the wherever that cheating occurred, that's possible where the venue could could um, happen. Um, or where the marriage last existed, or where one spouse lived. Um, any of those places are proper venue. Just like in Sift Pro, though, you're going to want to look at PJ and SMJ and make sure that you have all three um, because the court can't have just, if the court doesn't, if the court isn't the proper venue, you're going to want to refer it back to the other one. Remember, though, the um, result of an improper venue is to just transport to the proper venue. They're not going to just dismiss the case and be like, this is this is not good. This isn't where it needs to belong. They're just going to transfer it to the proper venue. Yeah. Um, so... You just, you just want to make that argument, you know, this isn't the best venue for this reason. Venue is proper in these three places. It's not one of those three places. It should belong over there. Um, venue probably isn't going to be a big issue. It's not likely to be a big issue. Um, it's probably going to be one of those things where they try to hide it and just be like, oh, this is where they sued. And then you don't think about it because it's a very small one sentence issue that they, they hide in there. Right. Um, and I like everything you've done so far. Is there reason for modification, you know, and it has to be substantial? unforeseen change in circumstance and then you have to talk about jurisdiction both personal and subject matter and then you have to talk about venue and remembering the six month uh requirement is the key piece so far right um and so now we're going to get into the actual uh, meat and potatoes of um a dissolution um and so parenting um you're not taught and i want this is the thing i'm going to stress this was a stress when i was in ibis prep you're not talking about custody. You do not want to say the word custody. Florida has gotten rid of custody. That is not the term anymore. The term is time sharing. You are sharing your child, your time sharing. Um, and the term you're going to use a million times, a billion times, as many times as you can, is the best interest of the child. Like Andrew said, that is the thing that is going to save the day. If a, if a kid is mentioned in a test, in an essay, you should spend at least half that essay talking about what is in the best interest of that child um and so that that's what it comes down to they're going to build a parenting plan and in that parenting plan they're going to talk about decision making authority and isn't someone's name here sus yes sus class um th this goes decision making authority goes back to sus um sus um shared ultimate or soul so in the parenting plan they're going to set up a time sharing regime in which it's either shared ultimate or sole shared is the court is a tiebreaker and so the example i use in my and my students is let's say that my wife and i get divorced and we have a kid um and um we don't actually have a kid just to be clear we consider my cat our kid but that's for another day um but let's say we have it we get a divorce and my wife really wants our kid to participate in tap dance and i think that i don't want them to participate in tap dance because i don't want them to go to tap dance whatever for whatever reason um, if we have this really big argument about it and we can't decide about like whether she's going to go to tap dance or not, you have to go to the court and say, Hey, I want to do tap dance. I don't want to do tap dance. And then the court will decide. Okay. Um, ultimate means if we keep going back for tap dance, if we keep over and over going over and over again, I, my wife keeps wanting to do extra curriculars. I keep saying, no, we keep going back. It's a back and forth thing. We go into the court like nine times in one year, the court will eventually agree with one of us scenario they're probably going to agree with my wife right because why in god's name would i not just allow my kids to do the things that they want to do so they will give my wife ultimate decision making authority over their activities or maybe it might be about health related things maybe maybe my wife um wants to make decisions as to whether they're going to get vaccines or not things like that they might give my wife ultimate decision making authority over that issue because they agree with my wife's decision making authority so far 
And that's when, the, and the way you think about that is when you're ignoring the court. If the judge is sick of seeing you, they're going to give ultimate decision-making authority to one of the parents. Um, and this can also be like, a, if I'm being vindictive, if I keep suing her and taking her to court because I don't want her to have a good relationship with my kids, stuff like that. It's going to give ultimate decision-making. And then the soul is really a last-ditch effort. It's not a last-ditch effort. It's a last, it's a worst-case scenario. That's when one party is a danger to the child. Thinking about, you know, drug users, thinking about known criminals, thinking about people that are in jail. Um, these are these are situations in which the court would be afraid that the child spending time with that parent or that parent making decisions for that child could be a danger to the child. Um, and so in those instances, in the parenting plan, they're going to build out that only one parent can make decisions for that child. That one parent gets sole decision authority. Um, and so they're going to build a parenting plan in which they share time and that's going to be in the best interest of the child. You know, if the child wants to spend 50 50, they're going to spend 50 50. But if one parent is a danger, then only one parent is going to get sole interest of the child, the other parent that's not a danger. This is pretty simple. I mean, it, it kind of, this is all very like, like, I think that all makes a lot of sense. Um, it's just about getting the right words to match the logic behind like getting the legal jargon to match the logic behind what you already know in your head. Um, any questions about this? No, I get it. Ultimate means like, uh, yeah, I'm good at sports. I put them in baseball. My wife's good at education. She puts them in math class. That's, you know, we right. as an by topic. I like that. Cool. So right. JP, um, E's coming up next. Does anyone know what E stands for? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, I see. I E C E. You're shaking easy. your head. What is it? Oh, gonna I was going to say equitable distribution. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's good. Good job. Both of you. Um, that easy. I couldn't even think of it. So no. oh, so uh, we're actually going to do a pop quiz. Even I, it, it was pop quiz for even me. So Amy and Bob get divorced after a five-year marriage. They have two kids together, Charles and Derek. Amy has spent much of their time caring for children, while Bob has shown little interest in them. After divorcing, however, Bob indicates he wants primary control of the children. Amy has a small one-room apartment, while Bob has a three-bedroom home. Bob works for 90 hours a week, and Amy works from home. What should a court do with it? So ECE, you didn't get to answer the last one. So let's go ahead. ECE, go ahead. G give me yes. the answer. So the court would consider what is in the best interest of the child in making that parenting plan. Um, if they can, the parents can agree on things, they'll have shared parental uh, responsibility or decision-making authority. Um, but where they have certain disagreements, uh, one parent may be given, um, ultimate authority, decision-making authority for that specific, uh, issue. Right. Does anyone want to make an argument for what is in the best interest of the kid of Derek and Charles? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make the argument that, uh, it would probably be in the best interest of the child to stay with Amy, um, because Bob is working. 90 hours a week great does anyone want to make, make make an argument on the other side yeah the small one no, bed i'm just saying oh go ahead no go ahead sorry i was gonna say her apartment's kind of small and um he has a bigger apartment and he wants to spend more time with the kids that's a good thing as well because some parents don't care <laughs> right yeah, and that's that's important. Both of you are correct, right? Like both of you are valid reasons why one party might get more control than the other. Um, and so it's just important just saying both those things and saying, so you would say situation the court would take the best interest of the child. These are the reasons why it might be in the best interest to go to mom. These are the reasons why it might be the best interest of the child. In a situation like this, the court will take the best interest of the child, right? Just say that as many times as you can and um, you're not wrong, right? Like, and, and then you can make a you can make a conclusion whichever way you want. Um, it doesn't matter, um, which whatever way is fine as long as you say the law as many times as you can. It makes me think how interesting the parenting agreement would have been for the uh, Kim Kardashian Kanye West divorce, and what yeah, what, what they determined each one of them is really best. That's at. Best. That would that would make a great law school exam, actually. You know, like the modification side and all that. No, stuff. We're, yeah, we're always staying current, and this this time I'm, I'm getting ready for criminal law when we're going to talk about Alec Baldwin and his oh yeah oof yeah all right let's see um, equitable distribution or equitable yeah equitable distribution um 
marital property is always split in half. Anything gotten in the marriage is marital property. Um, and, but that includes appreciation of property gotten outside of the marriage up to when the dissolution will happen. So if, and this is the best example, my wife, when she was like 12, got a bunch of bearer bonds from her aunts that um, she has kept her entire life. So she still owns them. Um, up until the point that we got married, the value of those bearer bonds were hers. We got married, the, that value of the bearer bonds still hers. But any appreciation after we got married belongs to both of us. If we got divorced, let's say they were worth $50. And then at the time of our divorce, let's say they were 50 when we got married. And at the time of the divorce, we got, they're worth 100 At the time of our divorce, we would split $50 because they appreciated by $50. And that's the easiest way to think about it. When you the the when the marriage occurs, starts the clock, and then when the marriage ends, ends the clock. You split whatever appreciated in that time, um, and that can be for a house, that can be for a car, that can be for you know even like like a Yu-Gi-Oh card that used to uh, used to cost very little, but you know got very rare after some time. You know like. Anything that I can appreciate during the marriage will add to the marriage property. Non-marital property includes things gotten before the marriage and not mingled, and things gifted or inherited and not mingled. And April made a very good point when I was teaching her this, that basically this, if you like, if you use like that math thing, if you like cut out all of the, um, the like numbers, um, really what you get here is things not mingled. Um, anything not mingled during the marriage is going to be non-marital property. Um, but it can't be gotten during the marriage. So basically what you're thinking about is if you get it during the marriage, it's automatically going to be um, uh, marital property. But if it's gotten outside of the marriage, and by that I mean gifts are inherited, and it's not mingled, then you're good. And what mingled means is, and the really the thing you're going to have to worry about is money. If my aunt gives me 50 bucks and then I go and put it in my joint checking account with my wife, guess what? That 50 bucks is now mingled. It's both of ours. She gets 25, I get 25. If my aunt gives me 50 bucks and then I go and put it under my bed, under my bed, and I never tell my wife about it, guess what? That's not mingled. I keep that 50 bucks if we get divorced. And so it gets a little bit trickier when you talk about real property, like let's say a jet ski. Um, how do you know when a jet ski is mingled? I don't know. I, I, th does a court really know? I don't think so. Um, so you just make the argument on both sides. You say, you know, if I own a jet ski, if I got a jet ski outside of marriage, I owned it before we got married, but my what I stopped using it and my wife uses it every single weekend. Well, then you might say, actually, that's mingled. Or more, more poignantly, um, if I go to the DMV or whoever registers jet skis and I get my wife's name put on the title for that jet ski, well, then that's definitely mingled. You see, and so it gets a little bit trickier for real property, but not not all that difficult. Um, you'll see the you'll see the sign, and then um, you get a marital interest in non-marital property. And so what that means is, um, if um, if you get an item outside of marriage, and then um, you you know give your wife or a, a, give your spouse a marital interest in that property, that means that 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 marital interest will allow them to take some part of it, maybe not an equal distribution, but some part of it upon divorce. Does that make sense for everyone? Does anyone have any questions about equal equitable distribution? Yeah, it's a marital property state as opposed to a community property state. So if anyone yeah, that's important. coming from a different state, they're, they're not confused. This is perfect. Perfect explanation of equitable distribution. What's um, gotten before the marriage and what's not mingled, you can have an argument is not marital property, but most things are assumed marital property. And this is because when you're married, you guys are, you know, you're a unit. So if the husband is working and, and making a pension, well, the wife has a claim to that pension because she's doing supportive work for the marriage that enables him to get that pension. That's kind of the- Right. Cool, so J, right. MJV piece, P-E-A, um, equal distribution, a is going to stand for alimony. That's it. Yep. Perfect. I'll go start with the pop quiz. Amy and Mary got married when they were 24. They are now getting divorced. Their notable assets include a $50,000 uh, bank account, a house, and two cars. 
Bob also had a number of bonds that his aunt gave him when he was 20. A week before the divorce was filed, Amy's aunt dies and left her 20,000. Knowing the divorce was imminent, Amy only deposited 5,000 in their joint checking account. Who gets what? So what about this $50,000? Someone, someone who hasn't answered a question yet. Well, who gets what? Who gets what of this 50,000? Anyone? Go, go ahead, EC. <laughs> They'll, that'll get split. That's a marital asset. What about the, what right, about this it, house? Uh, they'll try to sell it, right? And well, they it. can either sell it. So when they have a property like this, they can do one of two things. So the the value will be split down right down the middle. So let's say this house is worth just for ease. Let's say this house is worth a hundred dollars, right? Um, and so uh, I know it's a it's a really crappy house, like basically just a shack. Um, so let's say this worth is a house is worth a hundred dollars. What will happen is both of them are entitled to a hundred dollars or fifty dollars, right? A half of the house. So what will happen is if one of them wants to keep the house, they'll just pay $50 out of the lump sum from, they'll basically pay out the interest, the other person's interest in the house. Um, so either they, they sell it like you said, and they just both get half of the proceeds or one of them will buy out the other one in the house. And then two cars, exactly the same thing as the house. Sell it, Or they, they, may, they might just decide, you know what? That one's my car, that one's your car. We'll just each take one car. Um, whatever. Um, what about Bob's bonds? Bob's bonds. Um, what happens with those? Do you want to take a stab? I Go ahead. I would say that the, uh, oh. okay. I think you got cut out. No, I was just going to say, I thought somebody else was talking. I didn't want to over talk them, but I was just going to say that um, those bonds might be his since he had them when he was 20 and they got married at 24 and it doesn't seem like he ever called me hold them. So is there one other thing we need to, look, we need to worry about for, in terms of a bond? Oh, like if the, if the price went up? If they, appreci if they appreciated value. So if they appreciated value, which just means they gained value, then um, you would, um, whatever appreciation occurred, that would also be split in half. So if they're worth more now, the additional value would be split in half. And then um, what about this $20,000 in which Amy only deposited five in their checking account? What about that extra 15? EC, go ahead and take this one. So that <clears throat> most likely that 15 would be Amy's as it's, uh, it was a gift to her individually um right. but i i think because of the fact that she deposited some of the money into the joint account it kind of gets a little messy right and that that's perfect pardon me you know it's unclear if all of it's mingled because only some of it's mingled but definitely that five thousand is mingled there's no doubt about that there's some doubt about that fifteen thousand, but you don't really need to get into an exact conclusion of that just make the argument get out awesome so like usually specific requests are not marital property like yeah. that's the main argument was, but because they put the five in, that definitely commingled it. That was awesome. That was a fun little process. All yeah, right, so they'd, split, they'd split that five, right? Yeah, that was dumb of her to do. She shouldn't have put it in there. Knowing the divorce was imminent, she should have kept it in her. Big box. Yeah. yeah. All right, A for Alan. Um, yeah, so alimony is based entirely on the need and ability to pay. Um, so there are five types of alimony, temporary, rehabilitative, bridge the gap, durational, and permanent. Um, and they all pretty much sound, they are exactly what they sound like. Temporary is just for the course of dissolution. So if my wife and I are getting divorced, um, she needs money while we're getting divorced to, you know, stay on her feet, then we, I'll pay for, I'll give her alimony while we're getting divorced. Um, and, and, and the divorce might last longer than actual, like it, the, the actual divorce might take just one signing of a piece of paper, right? If we're, if it's an amicable divorce, but maybe it takes a while for us to actually separate. Like maybe we're living, living together for a little while afterwards that I might pair that alimony while we're still, you know, she's trying to like move out and stuff like that. Um, rehabilitative, um, helps become independent. If my wife didn't have a job and I was, I was supporting her entirely. Um, and she has no ability to pay for herself for a while. I would give her rehabilitative and alimony so that she could, um, support herself in that interim where she's trying to become independent from me 
bridge the gap is just from one state of life to the next. So potentially maybe my wife decided she was going to become a, maybe my wife was like, you know what, I'll drop out of college. I'll become a stay at home mom. I won't get my degree. I don't want to, I had this um, lucrative field that I was going to go into, but I'm not going to it anymore. I might have to pay bridge the gap alimony to, you know, help her get that degree um, that she dropped out of because she decided to marry me. Um, that kind of, that, that's a very specific example, but any kind of time when you're moving from one stage of life to the next, as a result of the divorce or as a result of the marriage, then you can get bridge the gap. Durational is based on the term of marriage. What I would advise you is that it's just based on how long the marriage is. So if it was a short marriage, you get short durational alimony. If it was a medium length marriage, you get a medium length mar alimony. And if it was long term marriage, you get long term alimony. There are specific numbers that go with durational. Uh, they're in the outline. You're going to go through it later with with Andrew. But as a like baseline, like I'm just trying to memorize it. Like this is what I need to know. Just know that durational is based on the length of the marriage, and it can be short, medium, or long term. And then finally, there's permanent alimony. This is when you're just getting alimony for life. You're forever getting alimony. Um, the the court has pretty much wide discretion to decide which is necessary. And again, it's based on need and ability to pay. So if I'm a millionaire, it seems more likely that permanent alimony will be will be you know we will be allowed but if i if my wife and i both make like fifty thousand dollars then it seems like neither of us really need alimony and we both have an equal ability to pay alimony so alimony might not be necessary in that case if i'm making 60 and my wife is making 30 well then maybe we just need temporary or rehabilitative you know it's just case by case scenario make the arguments you want to definitely mention all of them and then make an argument for which one is necessary in that specific situation in the essay. Um, and then finally, we talked a little bit about prenup and postnups here. Um, there has to be sufficient time to review and reflect the, the uh, and so prenup or postnups are agreements you, uh, you enter into um, to um, determine if it's a prenup, it will determine that's what you enter before you get married. And that determines what will happen in the dissolution um, if you do get divorced and a postnuptial is when you enter it during the marriage. And again, it kind of, it says, this is what's going to happen if we get divorced. So no matter what, whether it's prenup or a postnup, you have to have a sufficient time to review and reflect. And that has to include the ability to seek legal counsel and statements during the presentation of the agreement must be fair and accurate. Like you can't just be like, ah, sign it. I love you. You don't have to worry about it. And then the next week you're like divorcing them and you knew it was a bad agreement for them. Um, there can't be any kind of like misleading statements made during the you know the presentation of the agreement um and that's alimony um kind of, kind of a really big crash course in alimony I, it, it is a pretty simple thing in the long run um but there's just a lot to get through um any yeah. questions about alimony super solid man you're doing awesome um let's just keep it moving for time's sake awesome. JP. great um child support is pretty simple um, court totals both parents' net income, finds the support amount in the statutory chart. And again, do not waste your time looking at the statutory chart. It's a lot of numbers. It's not worth your time. You just need to say this sentence. Um, and actually, you should probably say both sentences. Both sentences here, then allocated between the parents according to their respective need and ability to pay. So basically, um, both of the net incomes are, are added up. They, they find the place on that chart. Let's say that chart says, Okay, this child should be getting $30,000 a year to support it. Or like, let's say $10,000 a year. They're probably more close to what I could. $10,000 a year to support it. Um, then they say, the wife can pay that much of this $10,000. The dad can pay that much of $10,000. That's what they have to pay. Like, boom. That's it. Um, but remember that if a child is spending 20% of the nights with the person paying support, there must be an adjustment. So if mom is paying, if mom is... Um, the primary caretaker of the child. She has the, um, what are we calling? We're not calling it custody anymore. What are we calling it? Time sharing. I, I, time sharing, right. Um, so if mom is getting most of the time with the kid, then mom isn't going to pay child support. Dad is going to pay whatever extra money needs to go into um, supporting for the child, right? Based on the statutory chart. But if the kid is spending 20% of their time or more with dad, then dad doesn't have then dad doesn't have to pay as much in child support obviously because he's supporting the child at his own home right so that kind of makes sense right like you mom shouldn't be getting it's kind of like a windfall for mom at that point because she's not supporting the child 
as much, but she's still getting just as much money. Um, does that make sense? That, that, that seems pretty simple. Um, all that seems pretty simple. Just, I would just straight up memorize these two lines. It yeah. Memorize these two lines. Best interest of the child. That's Right, exactly, yeah. I, I remember when Jeremy showed us the statutory chart last time. It was, in, it was interesting to see what he's talking about. It's like this whole Excel sheet that just shows like, you know, what you have to pay and it's very complex. So, right. If anyone, if anyone, and you do not need to worry about that. If anyone needs a good family law attorney, I know one. Um, he's a man. Really good. Yeah. He's, he's the one who taught me this. So, um, but so, yeah. And then, so everything else means attorney fees. Um, and this is the, e in the entirety of the bar, attorney's fees on family law is the easiest thing you were ever going to say. You are just going to say the ability to pay based on need. So the, the fees on the family law attorney must be based on the ability, ability to pay based on need. And you're going to cite to Rosen v. Rosen. That's simple. Um, that, that, the two lines, two sentences, and then you boom, bada, bing, you're done. Um, we'll just keep on trucking. And the last thing in MJV piece is this. Wait, 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 wait. Um, E stood for everything else. And and everything is weak. I know it's weak, Andrew. Yeah, it's weak. E is everything else. Everything else. It really means it's attorney fees. Fees and okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. Let's run. Duration. Let's go to D. Dissolution. A dissolution. Um, Florida is a no fault dissolution state. Um, that means there are two reasons to dissolve. The marriage is ir irretrievably broken. You can basically on any grounds just make the argument. So if they cheated, if they if they just don't feel like they love them anymore, if they, any reason that it's ir irretrievably broken, then it can be divorced. Or if there's mental incompetency of three years or more, that's it. That, I mean that those are the reasons. Um, the huge huge fact right there is that Florida is a no fault divorce state, right? You even right. if someone's cheating or they, they give you facts that it's all Wendy's fault, it it doesn't matter. And I think right. if I'm going to use some poetic justice here. Can we change everything else to Esquire fees? Oh, that's perfect. I love that. I love that. Yeah. New York. Um, yeah. So, um, a little bit. Um, but so for dissolution, um, it's not on the slide here, but the um, the judge can order potentially order um, go to counseling. They can order counseling. But you don't have to. It's a, it's a, it's a, a preference, not a requirement. So if you, if you want to go to counseling, the judge can say, you know what? I don't think this is irretrievably broken. I think you should go to counseling to see if you can. But if one of the parties says no, they can't force the issue. If one of the parties says no, they have to continue with the dissolution proceedings. Um, but um, that is, um, in the long run, that is the nuts and bolts of what you need to know for um, family law. And 96, that's the year you were born? Yes, it is, yeah. Nice, that's good, good year. Um, awesome, that was really great. I just wanna reiterate what Will was able to share with us today, which was amazing mnemonics for trust and family law. For trust, it was valid trust, don't ruin marriages. Is the trust valid? Is it, what type of trust is it? Um, what are the trustee duties can we remove the trust and can we modify the trust if you can go through that you're going to do very fine on a trust essay remember trust essays come with uh family law essays they come with real property essays it might not be its own trust essay it might be but there's a good chance it's a mixed essay so valid trust don't ruin marriages and then for uh family law we had this acronym of mjv peace modification now that modification might not be the first thing you talk about but it is good to remember like has there been a modification and are there proper circumstances the j is going to be for jurisdiction personal subject matter remember the six month requirement um the v is going to be for venue which is pretty obvious where it, where it occurred um and then peace parent parenting rights um equitable distribution uh alimony child support Esquire fees and dissolution of the marriage. Now this afternoon, we'll go over, you know, some details of these things that, you know, just in my outlines that I may have seen, 
Will, everything that you have, including your PowerPoints, your outlines, your cheat sheets, literally everything and anything, you know, give to me to add to the, um, the uh, course materials. And I think this is really, really incredible. Thorough, quick, easy. Anyone have any questions about uh, trust or family law? More specifically, family law? Um, yeah, I, I, I wrote this down before. So I, I knew that Florida is a no fault state. You had, you had mentioned, um, I think it was for dissolution where there's a breach. Is it still considered a, it, it's still considered a breach, even though there's no fault, like say if one parent, if one spouse cheats on the other, so <coughs> a breach of the marriage, but not. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a breach of the marriage and that really just goes to where the venue is proper. Um, it really doesn't. It's considered a breach and the judge can take it into account but it's a no fault in terms of um, it won't, it won't there, there doesn't need to be a fault in order for the marriage to be dissolved right so the breach is like if your spouse cheated on you where exactly the cheating occurred so, um <laughs> that's I'm, my understanding <laughs> but that, that's funny to think about well this was a really really awesome amazing session um this afternoon, we're going to go over a bunch of essays from four to seven. And then after that, we're rooting for the Philadelphia Eagles, my hometown team. Um, and that'll be fun. So thank you, everyone. Will, I can say how grateful I am. You're an awesome teacher. And I mean, the mnemonics are great. If you can just remember the mnemonics and put them in place on test day, that's awesome. If anyone wants to work with Will one-on-one, -on -one, you know, we're available for the next month. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Will.